like to say thank you very much. And uh, I don't know, how do you say with a straight face, it's a pleasure to be in Southampton in the wintertime. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, flying into New York this morning from Providence, Rhode Island. And uh, I was a little sleepy because I'd been up all night. So I decided when I got on the plane, I would get me a little sleep. So I rushed on the plane and sit down. And it was a white cat sitting next to me. So naturally, I checked him out. <laughs> <laughs> and he was pretty groovy, you know. So I dozed on off and went to sleep. About 15 minutes after I get to sleep, this white cat decides he wants to strike up a conversation with me. <laughs> So he did it the usual way. You know. Wake up, boy. <laughs> I woke up. <laughs> Only to find out that he really had nothing to talk about. No, he wanted to discuss Negro progress in America. I tried to inform him I did not want to discuss black progress in America because there's too few people in America that really realize what areas we've made a tremendous amount of breakthroughs in. A lot of people think we've made tremendous progress in jobs and housing and education. You know, the biggest breakthrough for black folks in the history of this country happened two years ago in the state of Texas. We got our first colored hurricane, Beulah. <laughs> I guess little by little, when you think about it, we, we're doing pretty good in certain areas. Television, every time you look at television, you see something black. And it's about time, too, you know. We got so damn sick and tired of looking at that white dove fly through that white woman's kitchen. <laughs> oh, Marge, there's a white dove in your kitchen. See, if just one time I could see my sister run through there and yell, Beulah, baby, there's a black crow on the biscuits. <laughs> And this year, we got our first colored cowboy. You dug this black cat on television? He's something else, too. I can't think of the name of that show, The uh, Outcast. Outcast. Yeah, you can tell by the name, it's us. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, we're going to get another black cowboy, so this one has somebody to kill. <laughs> I don't mean it like that, man. let this cat kill a, a white cowboy every now and then, but you see, the script writers are complaining because whenever it becomes the black cat's turn to kill a white cowboy, the script writers really got to go through some changes. You know, like they got to dirty up this white cat so when the black cat gun him down, you know, nobody would get uptight. Yeah, about three weeks ago, the black cat killed a white cowboy. This white cat had just finished raping a blind paraplegic. <laughs> Salvation Army worker, right? <laughs> so let me say it is a pleasure to be with you young folks this evening. I guess I can truthfully say that I spent about 98% of my time today on college campuses, and for a reason, simply because you young folks in America today is probably the most morally dedicated, committed group of young people that's ever lived in the history of this country, born none. <laughs> I hope you don't have to depend on these old right-wing, cracker-controlled newspapers to read them to find out who you are, because you never learn. What these newspapers say about you, they say that you are Hippie, yippie, irresponsible, bearded, smelly kids, whatever that means. And, and the question that comes to mind is because you have a beard, why does that mean you have to stink? <laughs> and they don't say nothing about Abraham Lincoln. And he didn't only have a beard, he was ugly too. <laughs> You see, the average established newspaper in America is, is really too immoral to even discuss you young people with yourself. 
They've never been honest with you. The newspapers in this country have never, they're so busy putting you down, they've never once reported that had it not been for you, LBJ would probably still be the president today. <clears throat> You young kids created an atmosphere where LBJ had to retire. Do you know how strong that is? LBJ is probably the number one tyrant that walked the face of this earth since Julius Caesar. And you young kids sent him back to the ranch and you didn't use one missile, one firebomb, or shoot one shot. You just got out with a pure moral dedication. And he understood how powerful that was. Yeah, I wonder when the newspapers will become honest with you youngsters. You know, I'll tell you something that's very interesting that newspapers have never told you. 15,000 hippies and yippies showed up into Chicago at the Democratic Convention, and that made the difference of Nixon being the president instead of Hubert Humphrey. You know how powerful that is? You know how strong that is? 15,000? Because had you not showed up in Chicago and that scene not gone out over television, there was a lot of people that just got so upset over what they had to look at rather than vote for Nixon, they just didn't vote at all. And had they not been so embittered over the Democratic Convention, Hubert Humphrey would have been the president. You know how much power that represents when 15,000 of you young folks can decide the faith and destiny of this country? Oh, there's a lot of us old fools real upset not that you showed up in Chicago, but because your appearance there created an atmosphere where Nixon could win over Humphrey. And, and the groovy thing about most young people got enough sense to know that between Nixon and Humphrey really didn't make too much difference because when you're dealing with one of them stinking, nasty, slimy politicians, they all like the same. And you youngsters, as you work to change this system, is going to have to create an atmosphere where statesmen can enter the political arena instead of politicians. And so you have a big job. You know, it gets pretty embarrassing to me as I have to go all over the country and speak with young people and not only tell you that the faith and destiny of America depends on you, not only do I have to say to you that you have to solve the problems confronting America tonight, you have to solve problems that you had nothing to do with creating. Yeah, these problems confronting America today, they were here before you got here. But thanks to us old fools, they will not be here when you leave. I say thanks to us old fools because you see, we have created a situation for you youngsters that you have no choice but to solve the problems. Yeah, the generation of us fools that cross right ahead of you. You see, not only did we not solve the problems confronting America today, but for the first time in the history of America, we used up all the tricks. And so consequently, you young kids have the problem, but no tricks. And we wonder why you react the way you react, because you have no tricks. <laughs> I remember when I was a kid, my mother, my father, the whole community taught me, one day you're going to grow up, boy, and a white man's going to call you a nigga. And don't get mad, because God don't like no ugly. And sure enough, I grew up, and a cracker called me a nigga, and I didn't get mad, because God don't like no ugly. You know, I got seven little black kids at home right now, and me and my old lady ain't teaching them nothing. <laughs> and if a cracker ever makes a mistake to call one of them nigga, I can damn sure bet you gonna surprise them. <laughs> and out of the five, I know two of them gonna act accordingly. And so I say you youngsters have all the problems we left you, but but no tricks. <laughs> Let me say to you, I did not come here this evening to impress you, but only to inform you that when I leave here tonight, I couldn't care less about what you think about Dick Gregory, because I'll always have the one consolation of knowing that whenever we wake up this year, next year, 20 years from now, you'll always be able to say, at least Brother Greg didn't lie to us. And that's one of the big problems. That the establishment keeps lying to you 24 hours a day. And then after you catch us, we say, well, it's a generation gap. It's a moral gap. I stand here tonight and say, two and two is seven. And when you react to it, I say, oh, well, it's just a generation gap. I haven't got nothing to do with age. 
Virgin Russell, who's 98 years old, can leave London, England and come to America and be one of the youngest among us because he's going to reach you from a high ethical, moral, decent standpoint. Because we didn't just start lying to you. We started lying to you way back in the crib with that Santa Claus boy. <laughs> if you believe the first letter I ever wrote in my life went to a cat that didn't even exist, dear Santa. <laughs> now, when your mama lied to you, damn near anybody qualifies to tell you a lie. Because that Santa Claus boy, he goes over better in the white community than he do in the black community. Because you see, not that we don't dig Santa Claus, we just know damn good and well ain't no white cat coming in our neighborhood after midnight. So we're <laughs> And what's the number one lie we tell you young kids today? We say the number one problem confronting America today is the problem of air pollution. <laughs> that's what, well, that's what we tell you. The number one problem confronting America today is the problem of moral pollution. This is the most morally polluted, degenerate, insane nation on the face of this earth, born none. You youngsters have the job of giving America her sanity back. You have the job of making America the morally stable country that the Founding Fathers meant for her to be. And I hope you don't make the mistake that all these right-wing crackers make. They so busy running around eulogizing the country. America the beautiful. Oh, eulogies are for dead things. And thanks to you youngsters, America is not dead yet. And I hope you will not make it a practice of eulogizing America. I hope you will go out and examine this country and find out where the cancer is and cut it out. America the beautiful. Let me tell you something. If you ever meet anybody that think America is a beautiful country with your Indian brother still locked up on that reservation, you tell them I said they sick, sad, and out of their damn mind. And this country will never be a beautiful country as long as that Indian is up on that reservation. And if it can be beautiful to you with him up there, then you in trouble. And the sad thing about this country, and I think the most embarrassing thing, is we are the only country on the face of this earth that lies about what we all about. My tone don't pretend to be anything else but a communist and revolutionist. Them clowns over there in Moscow, Russia, they don't pretend to be anything else other than some communists. As dirty and as sick as Hitler was, he didn't pretend to the world. He let the whole world know that he felt them Nazis were superior to everybody else on the face of this earth. <laughs> them folks in South Africa, they don't lie. They let the whole world know they don't like them niggas. America is the only country that lies about what she is. That should embarrass you. Regardless of how dirty the rest of the world is, they will own up to what they are. We say we about one thing, but we do all together something else in this country. And so I say you youngsters have a, a big job. But thanks to us old fools, you're waking up mighty quick. Yeah, that's why I was tickled to death over what happened at the Democratic Convention. Because three days after the Democratic Convention was over, a lot of you young kids woke up. Three days after the Democratic Convention was over, the whole establishment tried to convince you that you did not see what you saw on television. They said it didn't happen. They said the, the, the press created it. You know, if Kosygin and the rest of them damn fool Russians in Moscow was dealing with the world as insane as America, you know they could beat that Czechoslovakian rap? <laughs> Just get on worldwide television and say, it didn't happen, y'all. <laughs> yeah, you didn't see it. So we admit we sent little miniature tanks to the Czech border for little kids to play with, and the damn press blew it up to make them look like real live tanks. <laughs> But them fools in Moscow, Russia made the same mistake these old fools made in America. They, they plotted their little action and they knew how the old folks was going to react, but they never took in consideration the reaction of you young kids. Oh, and them Russians moved them tanks into Czechoslovakia. They knew the old folks was going to be scared, but they, 
They never knew they'd see the day that young kids would run to their tanks and put SWAT stickers on the tanks. I guess it'd be the same thing in America. They plotted on bringing tanks into America. Sunday morning, wake up, and every church got a tank sitting in front of it, and loud speakers say, anybody try to go to church gonna get machine gunned to death. They know damn good and well them old fools ain't about to go to church. But what they wouldn't consider, that in America, young people that ain't never been to church in their life would decide to go Sunday morning. <laughs> That's why you keep the system upset. 15,000 hippies and yippies came to Chicago to, to change the system. And the whole establishment got uptight. Now, mind you, that's a very important word, change the system. Because you see, that's what they was uptight over in Chicago. Didn't have nothing to do with what you kids was doing there. Didn't have nothing to do about tearing up the town. No. And to prove that, for the last 10 years, every spring break, you white kids been going to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, tearing the whole town up, man, and nobody gives a damn. They say, well, they're getting drunk, boys, we'll be boys. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> but Chicago, it was that you was coming to change the system. And the whole establishment got uptight. Let me ask you something. Who do you think was the most immoral in Chicago last year? The hippies and hippies or the Shriners when they came to town for their convention? Who do you think committed the most adultery and spent the most money on whores and prostitution? The hippies and the hippies or the Shriners when they came to town for their convention? Nobody got upset over the Shriners because the Shriners didn't come to change nothing just to buy something. <laughs> You know, what's interesting about television, if you look at it long enough, is bad as the programming is on television, if you just keep looking at it long enough, that thing will accidentally slip through. That same television set that showed you the hippies and yippies in Chicago, nine weeks after the Democratic convention was over, that same television set showed you another crowd in the street that nobody got upset over. Of course, they weren't irresponsible kids, neither, and it wasn't Chicago. You remember that morning in New York City, 20,000 sick, slimy degenerates came out in Wall Street to look at the broad's titties. <laughs> Nobody got upset over the titty watchers. <laughs> Jed Hoover have yet to get on television and proclaim that titty watching is definitely communist inspired. <laughs> What do you call 20,000 sick, slimy, degenerate titty watchers? <laughs> Extremists left to right. <laughs> and if Sister Francine is really sincere about not wanting to be watched in the mornings, all she has to do is understand the way these old degenerates think. Yes, yeah, she hold a press conference tonight and say, tomorrow morning at 11.33, I'm going to get off that same subway wearing one of the tightest sweaters ever been worn in the history of the world. <laughs> and I guarantee you tomorrow morning in New York City at 8 o'clock, there will be 300,000 of them sick degenerates waiting on us. <laughs> when she emerges out of that subway at 11.33, with that tight sweater on, if she sincerely don't want to be watched, when she emerges up, have two signs across her bosom, one reading, free Huey Newton, baby, and the other one, bring the boys home from Vietnam. <laughs> now, I guarantee you, within two seconds' time, those 300,000 digits will be gone. Back into their... Madison Avenue officers have finished participating in the antitrust violations. So I say, you youngsters got a, a big job. You notice how today we try to make you youngsters think that there's never been such an irresponsible young kid in the history of America. Well, it's not that we didn't do things, we just never did things to change the system. See, that's what makes you irresponsible bring tear gas out and throw on you, and you just keep coming. Call the army out and you still don't behave. See, that's irresponsible. Never supposed to ignore that gun. 
Uh, we've always did little things when we was growing up in the country, but never did we try to <coughs> change the system. And so we hope you young kids understand why us old fools in this country so uptight. Now you youngsters want to tell us in America that morality will no longer mean a Brooks Brothers suit and a clean-shaven face and a haircut once a week. You, you must be out of your mind. You telling us the morality will no longer mean getting the latest fashions from Paris and bathing in Chanel number no. five and having all the abortions you want and you still miss it so-and-so. You young kids are trying to tell us that morality will no longer come from without, but will come from within. The youngsters is telling us that we'll never be able to buy our morals in this country no more. <laughs> That's why we're so upset with you. Because all at once you have decided you're going to change the system. Well, I remember when I was a kid, we, we had panty raids. Y'all remember that? Let me ask you something. Which is the mark of a degenerate, sick mind? A bunch of boys that goes into the girls' dormitory and steal all the draws or a bunch of cats to go and take over the administration building. Which is the mark of a sick, warped man? But for 10 years, we went into the girls' dormitory and stole all the draws, and nobody got uptight over it because we weren't trying to change the system. Then you say, well, boys will be boys. <laughs> 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 then we got tired of stealing your bloomers. And then we decided we see how many goldfish we could swallow. Remember that? They don't give a damn about you swallowing goldfish. They'll let you swallow a whale if you want to. <laughs> and then young kids got tired of swallowing goldfish and they decided to see how many they could stuff into a telephone booth. You pick up the front page of the paper and right on the back of the front page, University of Arizona sits new record, 500 kids stuff into one phone booth. <laughs> Then open up on the center page and they got some old freakish looking cat from Bell Telephone bringing a brand new telephone boot saying, boys will be boys. <laughs> you think boys will be boys? Don't take 500 kids downtown Manhattan one day. Just take five kids to downtown Manhattan with five picket signs. Don't get inside a telephone boot. Pick it on the outside of the telephone boot and have picket signs asking AT&T about those high absorbing long distance phone call rates and see how quick it'll take the cop to bust you and throw you in jail and see if anybody can bail telephone run around talking about boys will be boys. <laughs> As you youngsters got a big job to do, Thanks to us old fools, we really left you a mess to clean up. Last year they assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King and everybody got uptight. Oh, they assassinated Dr. King. They gunned down Bobby Kennedy. Oh, they killed Bobby. They assassinated JFK and everybody. Oh, they shot the president. You know, nobody in America got upset when they assassinated Lincoln Rockwell and Malcolm X. You see, America is not a nation that gives a damn about an assassination until you kill somebody we like. 98% of everybody in America that got upset over Martin Luther King's assassination, they would not be upset in the morning if George Wallace was assassinated. You got a big job. You got to make this a nation that gives a damn about assassinations regardless to who it is, or you have to make a nation that don't care about nobody being assassinated. You got a big job to do. So I say you youngsters got a mess clean up. One of the biggest jobs you have, I do not advocate destroying the capitalistic system, but I say to you young folks, you better work like hell to beat the capitalists into their rightful position, and that is behind the United States Constitution and not in front of it. Because as long as the capitalists are in front of the United States Constitution, that means in America we will always put emphasis on property rights, and there will be no emphasis on human rights. And this country is not controlled by the United States Constitution. This country do not function under the democratic process. This country is controlled and governed by the capitalists. That's why last year Americans came out and peacefully protested and peacefully assembled, peacefully petitioned for strong gun legislation. And the, the capitalists that manufactured the guns saw to it, you didn't get a strong gun legislation. In a nation so insane, we demand that you get a prescription to get your medicine, but you don't need a prescription to get your gun. 
Hell, I can't hit you in the head with my pills and kill you. Nor can I injure you by throwing my cough syrup on you. I'm not saying Americans shouldn't have guns. The Constitution says all Americans have a right to bear arms. But Americans got a right to get well, too. And if this country's going to make me go through some changes to get my medicine, then damn it, it should make me go through some changes to get my gun. So I say, you youngsters got a big job of moving the capitalists behind the United States Constitution. The only way you're going to do that is by directing all your grievances to the capitalists. Don't be no damn fool running down the street marching under the Constitution. They don't give a damn about the Constitution. The only reason they care about the flag is because they make it. <laughs> yeah, you let them pass a law and say from here on in the flag's going to be made by the blind Jewish welfare mothers and see how many people wouldn't be flying flags next 4th of July. <laughs> yeah, you see how many people get uptight over that flag. So you better check out this system real quick. We live in a country today that tell you 18-year-old boys at 18 years old, you're old enough to go to war and die, but you're not old enough to vote. Or any of you that go along with that, maybe death is what you need. And I meet so many young folks that say, if I've got to go to war and die at 18, I want the right to vote at 18. Don't be no damn fool. If you got to die at 18, you better fight to get the right to vote at 17. Because as groovy as you young kids are today, if you get the right to vote at 17, probably won't be no wars when you get 18. Yeah, you got a big job of moving the capitalists behind the United States Constitution. And how do you do that? Address all your grievances to the capitalists. You want the right to vote? At 17 years old, you can get that right. All you got to do is organize across the country. That's the first thing you got to do is organize. You want to change these colleges' administrations? Do it the easy way. Don't take over the administration building. Organize young folks across this country. And then next September, say, if we don't get all these reforms in the educational institutions, we're going to boycott eating meat five days a week. What do you think the packing house would do? What do you think the multi-millionaire right-wing cattle growers from Texas would do? Y'all talking about not eating no meat for five days out the week. Man, them right wingers are flying to town. Kick the doors off these president's office. Come here, boy, we want to talk to you. <laughs> you want the right to vote at 17 years old? You can get that. Don't be down here marching, candle flags, singing all them old tunes. You want the right to vote at 17 years old, you organize across this country. And after you get young folks organized, you go to the record industry. And you tell them if they don't get to Washington, D.C. and lobby and within two months' time get a bill pushed through that says 17-year-olds can vote, you're going to call for a nationwide boycott of buying photograph records for two years. <laughs> what do you think would happen? Yeah, before they sit back and let you wipe out a multi-billion dollar a year industry, they'll let 16-year-olds vote. <laughs> because you see, all these old fools, they don't buy no records. And if it is, it's one of them old Dirksen albums. <laughs> so I say you got a big job of moving the capitalists behind the United States Constitution. Because the capitalists have demonstrated time and time again they have a passionate disrespect for human rights. Well, the cigarette industry is a good example of it. Yeah, they're fighting the federal communication system like hell so they can keep their ads on television and radio. They don't even have respect for your little brothers and sisters. They only have respect for your unborn babies that watches those ads and they don't see the danger, they just see the glamour. Yeah, turn on television, air cat rolling across with a with a with a horse. Giddy up, giddy up, get up, and then he slows up, whoa, baby, and pulls out his pack of cigarettes. And I always likes to let me a marble. <laughs> and what's a little kid gonna do? He know damn good and well he can't never get him a horse, but he know he get him a marble one day. <laughs> Wouldn't be bad if they had honest cigarette commercials, show that old cowboy riding through the cemetery and stop. 
pull out a cigarette and say, this is Mambo country. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with cigarettes being on the market. You youngsters are old enough to know damn good and well cigarettes cause cancer, and you got a right to smoke them if you want to. You got a right to put a pistol to your head and pull it if you want to. But that's you. I think you should fight to protect these young kids. That if they knew cigarettes cause cancer at that age, they might develop a strange dislike for them. And so you cigarette smokers that don't give a damn about your chest, you still should protect the kids. And after you finish your next pack of cigarettes, it would be mighty groovy if you put that empty pack in the envelope and mailed it into the cigarette industry and asked your friends to do the same thing and put a little note in there and tell them if they insist on advertising on television and radio where your little brothers and sisters and the young kids can see it, you consider boycotting cigarettes. You'd be surprised how quick they decide to take their heads off. You got a job putting the capitalists behind the United States Constitution. And then for the first time, we'll put emphasis on human rights. The fact that we emphasize property rights is the reason Mayor Daly of Chicago made that statement he made, shoot all looters to kill. Never said shoot murderers to kill, never said shoot dope pushers to kill. You know why? Because murders and dope pushers deal with the human right, looters deal with property. And to be honest with you, when Mayor Daly made that statement pertaining to shooting all looters to kill, it's the first time I ever agreed with him. Yeah, I hurried up and sent him a telegram. I said, dear fool, <laughs> your statement pertaining to shooting all looters to kill, I agree with wholeheartedly. If you make one stipulation, let's first make it retroactive and let's first put the gun in the Indian's hand. Yeah, you youngsters got a big job. Keep your eyes open 24 hours a day and watch everything, especially all us old fools. And particularly, more watch your mom and daddy and ask them a lot of questions because you got to sleep with them. Oh, yeah, you know, somebody came by your house today and knocked on the door. Mother, father said, Who is it? Uh, say, uh, uh, a government inspector. Say, What do you want? Say, We come by to, to get your cat or your dog. Say, what? Say, yeah, we just got a bill pushed through. We're sending pets to Vietnam. <laughs> I don't have to tell you how much hell your mom and daddy would raise somebody try to send that dog to Vietnam. It'd be a shootout on the front lawn. <laughs> it sounds funny to you, but that's mighty scary when you got to realize you're living in a country today where your mom and daddy would raise more hell over the dog going to Vietnam than it raised over you going to Vietnam. Yeah, you got a job on your hands. Yeah, maybe if your mother and daddy stopped trying to make money for a few minutes and listened to what you young kids are talking about, maybe they would understand you for a change. But they're so busy making money. You ever stop to ask yourself which is the most important card in America today? The draft card or the Social Security card? Sure it is, Social Security card. Social Security card stays with you all of your life. Women and men have Social Security cards. Draft card stays with you a part of your life. Only men have draft cards beyond a shadow of a doubt. Social Security card is the most important card in America today. Why is it we all sitting in this room tonight can burn our Social Security cards and nobody gives a damn? And it's the most important card. But if you burn your draft card, they'd run the army in here on us. You know why, don't you? You young kids burn them draft cards, you saying to us old fools, one day, old fool, you're going to get this country in a war that we not going and fight for you, which means you're going to have to fight it yourself. But we old fools got news for you youngsters. Before we ever have to go fight our own wars, we'll quit having them. <laughs> I met a young fellow when I spoke at the University of Wisconsin after I finished, he rushed up to me and said, Mr. Gregory, can I speak with you for a few minutes? I, I got a problem I'd like to talk to you about. I said, yes, son, what's your problem? He said, you know, I'm a draft resistor, and I, I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. I said, why? Uh, did you do what you wanted to do? He said, yes. I said, did you do what you believed in? He said, yes. I said, well, there's something wrong, because if your conviction was not to go to war and kill people, 
A whole lot of people have been killed for their convictions, have been put in jail for their convictions. But any time you have a high, moral, decent conviction, you never have to worry about going crazy. She says, no, I, I, I think I'm having a nervous breakdown. I haven't got nothing to do with it. My, my draft resistance It's my mother and father. They don't have anything to do with me anymore since I decided to be a draft resistor. They don't write me. They send my letters back. I can't go home. I say, son, you haven't got a problem. The only problem you got is you. You silly enough to, to react to parents who think with the wisdom of fools. He said, but it's still my mother and father. I said, look, let me tell you something. Suppose you decided you wasn't going to be a draft resistor. Let's say instead of that, here at the University of Wisconsin at 3 o'clock in the morning, you took 40 sticks of dynamite and threw it into the girls' dormitory and leveled the whole building down to the ground and killed every girl in the dormitory. The minute your mama found out you did it, their mom and daddy would be on the first plane flying in here, putting up your bail money, running around talking, we don't know what got into our boy. <laughs> You're living in a nation today that can rally behind you faster if you commit murder than they can if you decide you're not going to war and kill anybody. Yeah, you youngsters got a big job today. <laughs> yeah, you got to ask a lot of questions. And one question you got to ask loud and clear, it's a simple question. That question is, if democracy is as good as we tell you it is, then why in the hell are we running all over the world trying to ram it down people's throat with a gun? And the day you youngsters work to make this democracy work right for the first time, that's the day we can bring the guns home. Because you see, anything good, you don't have to force on people. They will steal it. <laughs> so you have a big job. Probably the most important thing I'll say to you youngsters all evening is what I'm fixing to say to you now. And that is simply, I hope you young kids do not make the same mistake in these colleges and institutions that us old fools made when it was our turn to go. You see, when we went to college, we were so busy trying to learn how to make a living, we forgot to learn how to live. And I guarantee you tonight, if you waste your four years in these institutions just learning how to make a living, you haven't got a guarantee you can get a job and keep one after you get out. But I promise you, if you spend these four beautiful years learning how to live, Making a living will be the easiest thing for you to do on the face of this earth, born none. Oh, I meet so many people talking about, I'm going to go away to college learn how to be somebody. Hell, you was born somebody. And if you let somebody teach you how to be somebody else, that makes you two people. Check out what Sigmund Freud says happened to you when you become two folks. <laughs> Why you got to go away to college for four years and pay top dollar for somebody to teach you how to be crazy. Or I meet people say, well, uh, you got to eat to live. I'm going to college so I can get me a job so I can eat. Well, if you ever learn how to live, eating is the simplest thing in the world to do. A damn gorilla eat more food in one meal and you eat in six weeks. You ever known one to go to college so he can get him a job? <laughs> You ever bumped into a gorilla in the supermarket getting himself something to eat, shopping with it? And when's the last time you read where a gorilla starved to death? <laughs> you never read about a gorilla starving to death as long as gorillas know how to live. But the first time gorillas start learning how to make a living and forget to learn how to live, y'all gonna have colleges for them too. <laughs> oh, one day I hope these educational institutions understand that all they should be in business to do is to bring out from within what nature's already put in you, not to put anything else in you. That's totally impossible. Nature, you are nature. You know how powerful and how strong you are? Do you know what you represent? You are the universe. Check it out one day. Learn about your body and learn about the universe. Nine planets to the universe, you have nine holes in your body. That's no accident. You know how powerful you are? And all we should ever do in these educational institutions is just bring out what nature's already put in you. And if we ever learn to do that, we'll solve all the problems confronting mankind. <laughs> Let me show you how strong nature is. 
Raise your hand, those of you in the audience tonight that understands Chinese. Nobody, right? Two, three people here? I just said that to show you how strong nature is. Look at this huge audience tonight. Nobody understands Chinese. You are aware of the fact that right this moment, dogs in China do understand Chinese, don't you? Never been to college. <laughs> dogs in Russia understand Russian, and dogs in Germany understand German, do you? <laughs> I say that to say to you that through nature you're born with all the wisdom you need to get human dignity, fight your way out of one of these tricks, and get to your dinner. And so I hope you youngsters as you work to change the system, you will spend a lot of energy to change the education establishment for the first time, make them live up to their name, educate. Because the average school in America do not know how to educate. They've been too damn busy indoctrinating, and there's a difference between an education and an indoctrination, believe me. Oh, we're so busy programming you youngsters. Oh, we know how to do it, too. You come to class, yes, here's, your, here's your assignment. We'll give you a book to read. That's not where they program you. No, that's not where we program you. Now, after you finish reading the book, we give you the test. And if you didn't read the book the way we want you to read the book, you can't pass the test. That's programming. That's why young people in America will stoop to the lowest depths they ever stoop in their life to steal the test. Because, you know, once you get the test, you don't need the book because we don't grade the book. <laughs> no, we don't grade the book. We grade the test. And after we grade the test, we put it on that old thing called a transcript, which ain't nothing but a fraud. Right? That transcript don't mean nothing to nobody but to the establishment. And it's a way of controlling you. And if you think that transcript means anything to you, you graduate from college and 10 years from now meet somebody you want to marry and see if they ever ask to see your transcript. <laughs> if you think that transcript's important, you get ready to raise a family one day and see if you ever have to take it to bed with you. <laughs> you think that transcript's important? You graduate from college and let the administration build and burn down and burn up all the records and see if you have to go back to college. That transcript don't mean a damn thing. You let your house burn down and burn up all your money, you broke. <laughs> but burn up the transcript don't mean a damn thing because that ain't nothing but just a, a way we use to manipulate you young folk. And so I say to you youngsters tonight, you got a big job to see to it that educational institutions will live up to their name, and that is to educate and not indoctrinate. And most of the problems confronting the college campuses today, you can't blame on the administration or on a couple of small isolated incidents you can blame the administration, but most of the problems confronting the universities and colleges today, you can trace back to the board of directors. Who is the board of directors? If you took a survey of all the colleges in America and took all the names of all the people on the board of directors and looked them up and did research on them, you'd find out that 98% of them cats is causing all the problems on the face of this earth today. And the only thing that qualified them to be on the board of directors is because they made some money. Nobody even asked them how they made it. They don't know nothing about education and Lord knows they don't know nothing about you kids. So I say, you youngsters got a big job. Work to change the system. You look at all the board of directors of colleges that the Rockefellers are on. You imagine Rockefeller being on board of directors? If it wasn't for his damn Chase Manhattan Bank, them black brothers in South Africa could breathe a little bit fresh air. If it wasn't for his damn standard oil, the whole continent in South America could get free. And yet he's on one board of director after another. The hell can he tell you young kids about how you're supposed to carry yourself in life? Few people seem to understand what the black students are talking about. Few people seem to understand what black folks is talking about in this country. And white folks, is real funny, they run around getting all uptight, think we dislike you. You so damn insignificant, we ain't got time to dislike you. We don't dislike you. Oh, you got some niggas hate turnips. 
But basically, I guess it's just your white ego to just keep making yourself think that, that you are the one that's, you, you, you're so insignificant. We don't dislike you. We hate your stinking white racist institution. That's what we dislike. And we uptight with you because you're responsible for it. Not directly. Let me give you a better example. If you came by my house and we was good friends and you brought your little daughter with you and my dog attacked your daughter, who you going to sue, my dog or me? Although I didn't bite her, right? But I'm responsible for that dog. You're responsible for this white racist system. Not that you are a racist. You're responsible for the system because it's yours. Now, if you brought your daughter by my house and my dog leaped up on the couch and chewed up my daughter and bit yours, you wouldn't be as mad because both of us got a problem. And then if you brought your daughter by my house and my dog grabbed your daughter and I reached over and grabbed the dog and the dog damn near killed me, you wouldn't be mad at all. <laughs> and that's what we're saying. We very uptight over your dog biting us. We're going to stay uptight till either you change the dog or get in a position where he's going to bite you too what we're talking about. And if you can't understand that, we're in trouble. We hate this stinking white racist institution. This is what black folks is talking about on the college campuses today. I meet black folks that say, well, I don't understand these black kids today. They want a separate dormitory. Well, I went to a white college and we fought to integrate the dormitories. Well, I can understand them old black fools. They in the same bag I was in. I was so damn glad to get in a white college. I didn't mind all them little coon notes they used to stick under my door and all them little nigger signs they used to leave on the wall. But you got young black kids today that's fighting for a dignity and a manhood. And they say, before they take all these damn insults, let them be by themselves. What they talking about? And teach them black studies. And that's a legitimate request. All at once, young black Americans decided they're not going to be your nigga no more. So they say, teach them who they are. We sure our history go back further than slavery. A man without a knowledge of himself is like a tree with no roots. And so we're trying to, to destroy a white racist institution that humiliates us, that insults us 24 hours a day. And now I run across so many people interviewing, Mr. Gregory, uh, 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 what do you think about uh, uh, black folks asking for separatism? When you white folks get so concerned about separatism, why don't you go get that Indian off that reservation? That's a pure example of separatism, but it's okay as long as you're doing it. Yeah, first time that Indian hold a press conference and say, me like a heap of reservation, don't want no more white folks on reservation, you send your army up there and run him off. <laughs> it's a white racist institution that permit Jews to get just upset because you found out black anti-Semitism exists in the black ghetto. Every Jew in America over 15 years old know another Jew that don't like niggas. Now you find out some niggas don't like Jews, why are we so upset? Because in a white racist society, you permit the underdog to do the same thing to you, you do to them. And I'm so damn glad that black anti-Semitism come out in that black ghetto. It's been there all along. What you afraid of? You'll never be able to solve it as long as it was hidden. And that's why I'm glad. It's and what really knocks me out is all these black folks make like they didn't know it was there. That's the ones that got to keep getting that money from you. Oh, we're just so outraged. Oh, every nigga in America that lived in a large urban city heard his mama make an anti-Semitic statement. But that was okay because y'all didn't know about it. <laughs> now that it's coming out, and for the first time everybody know it's there, oh, everybody getting uptight now. No, if I had cancer, I want to find out about it. That's the only way I can cure it. And everything in that black ghetto we doing wrong, I hope it gets exposed. Because until it gets exposed, we'll never be able to deal with it. And so we say we're tired of this white racist institution. Have nothing to do with white folks. You know, all you white folks can leave America in the morning and leave nothing in America but black folks, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Indians. And if we had to use them same old trick tests to get in these institutions you take, we still couldn't get in them and you wouldn't even be here. That's what we're talking about. You're going to keep me locked in a black ghetto all my life. Then when I come to go to your college, you don't only ask me what is two and two. You start getting slick and say, what's the Eiffel Tower? How the hell I know? But I know what a rat is. 
Keep an Indian up on the reservation, and when he gets ready to enroll in your schools, you don't ask him nothing about the reservation. You want to ask him about your thing. This is what we're talking about. That's why we're talking about knock that test out, because it ain't fair. It's slanted to your thing and not to nobody else's. And so we're tired of this white racist institution. Two years ago, had I gone around this country advocating the problem in the black ghetto today, we need black capitalism. All you liberals would have said, that's racism. Well, white boy Nixon can advocate black capitalism. That's okay. You don't see nothing wrong with that because that's white boy doing that. You ever been on a railroad train? You see that black cat on the railroad? Can't be nothing but a Pullman port in the history of America. A nigga ain't been able to do nothing but just be a porter. That's okay because the system do that. Don't you know we had a press conference tomorrow and organized all the black Pullman porters and got on nationwide television and said, we as black Pullman porters don't want you white folks. We want y'all to know we don't want to drive your white train. We want you to know we don't want to take up your white tickets. Oh man, the whole country would be upset. Talk about that's racism. But as long as we've had the railroads, you ain't never let a black man drive these trains. That's okay because the system do that. And as dumb as white folks think of, we are. You don't need too much sense to drive a train. All you do is follow the damn tracks. <laughs> you ever look at a television show called The Dating Game? Any of you ever see that? Anytime they bring a, a, a black contestant on, they have three black guests. That never dawned on you that that's racism, did it? Because that's the establishment doing it. But if I went on the dating game next week and say, I'm not going to work it if you have any white ladies on there, I want three black women, you would say I was a racist. And we're tired of this white racist institution that as long as you doing it, it's all right. We're tired of these insults. We're trying to work to change this racist structure. You know, I'd like you youngsters to do me a favor. One day this week or next week, first chance you get, go by the library and copy down the Declaration of Independence. Don't read it, just copy it. You know how to copy without reading, don't you? Sure you do. And here's what I want you to do for me after you copy down the Declaration of Independence. I want you to keep the Declaration with you 24 hours a day. Never be caught without that declaration. And here's the favor I want you to do for me. When the ride season open up again, <laughs> can you believe this old stinking system and program black folks into believing that we got a ride season July through August? <laughs> yeah. Last year we didn't show up and the whole country got upset. Where were they? <laughs> Yeah, we didn't show up last July and August, and everybody got uptight. Where were y'all? We had the tanks waiting for you. <laughs> they asked George Wallace, why do you think they didn't ride last season? Is how you know them niggas is lazy and shiftless? They just got tired. <laughs> I'll tell you where we was last ride season. We got tired of stealing all them old bad, no good products. <laughs> So last July through August, we decided to go underground and study the consumer reports. <laughs> so when the ride season opened up again this year, we ain't stealing no more <laughs> baby. <laughs> now here's the favor I'd like for you to do for me. When the ride season opened up, I'd like for you to run home. Get around your mom and daddy and you black kids go home too because you know you got some niggas living in them houses which you to think more degenerate and more corrupt than the Ku Klux Klan could ever think and you do know what I'm talking about. And get your television set and put it in the, the middle of the room. <laughs> and then turn on the evening news because they're going to show them niggas riding and looting and socking it to the town. After you get the news on, turn on Huntley and Brinkley because they get close-ups. <laughs> Yeah, them other two networks, they try to cover the rides in helicopters because they're scared, you know. <laughs> but no, Huntley and Brinkley, they get such close-ups you can recognize your kin folks. <laughs> Look at that, hey, Uncle Dudlow, I didn't know he was in Detroit. Get it, man, get it. <laughs> now, after you get Huntley and Brinkley on, 
and they be showing them niggas riding. At that point, run upstairs and get your mom and daddy and bring them down and put them right in front of the television set. Just let them look. Look at them niggas burn the town. Just, just listen to their reaction. You've heard it before. And after you've heard enough of it, now the favor I want you to do me, I want you to go up and turn the sound off the television. Pull out your Declaration of Independence, and with the sound turned off so they can't hear nothing, just look at them black folks loot and burn the town down. At that point, I want you to move way in the back of your parents, and while they looking at them cats burn, I want you to read your Declaration of Independence as loud as you can read it, and maybe for the first time, them fools will understand what they're looking at. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights that when these rights are destroyed over long periods of time it is your duty to destroy or abolish that government. them old fools is gonna assume that was some message Malcolm X left for Rap Brown. <laughs> but I know with a minimum amount of persuasion you can teach them fools that that was their beloved Declaration of Independence. Yeah, that one with that mistake on it. That one where they forgot to write for white only. <laughs> you know, as funny as that may seem that you know, we dumb enough that if you didn't put white only on it, we dumb enough to read it and believe that that Declaration of Independence was written for all Americans. But when we do what it says do after long periods of injustices and you call us hoodlums and thugs, we realize for the first time that the Declaration of Independence was written for you. Why don't you label it so we will know? And then get it out of my black ghetto. I remember I was back in the ghetto in grade school, happy, just being a good nigga, singing my blues. I love my baby. Oh, baby, love, 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 love. And the principal ran up to us one day and said, Board of Education said, y'all can't graduate from grade school till you read and learn the Declaration of Independence. I said, what? The Declaration of Man, we ain't gonna read that old white stuff. Okay, so you ain't gonna graduate. I said, lay it on me then. <laughs> As a long piece of justice, boy, you have a duty to destroy or abolish your government. I say, hey, baby, y'all got some more of this stuff laying around? <laughs> you white folks really sick enough to believe you can put this stuff in our neighborhood and we're not going to read it and do what it says do? You white folks sick enough to believe you can still draft niggas into your army and send them down to Fort Benning, Georgia and teach them how to be gorillas and send them to Vietnam, killing foreigners to liberate foreigners and think they're not going to come back to America and kill you to liberate their mammy, then you sicking out your mind. Right. No, you ain't dealing with no World War II niggas no more that you could just turn on and turn off. <laughs> and after you get that declaration out of my community, real quick, run and get that, that filthy white boy American history book out of my ghetto. Because let me tell you something, there's no way in the world you can expect niggas to behave and keep making us read your history. Baby, your history tells me from the time you landed at the Plymouth Rock, you shot and murdered your way all the way across to California. Are you serious? You really think you can give me that and think I'm going to behave? You ever read your history book? You think George Washington made the history book because he was a good preacher and he learned how to sing, we shall overcome, and he went around preaching now about He made your history book because he kicked the hell out of the British, killed every one of them he got his hands on. <laughs> You got to be joking with that history book of yours. You tell me in that history book that you came to these shores and discovered a country that was already occupied. You think about that. 
<laughs> and then got nerve enough to call a nigga hoodlum. <laughs> How do you discover something that's not only owned by somebody else, but's being used at the time you discover it? That's like me and my old lady walking out of here tonight and you and your lady sitting in your brand new automobile and my lady say, gee, honey, that sure is a beautiful automobile. I sure wish it was mine. I say, well, Lillian, let's discover it. <laughs> I sure wish you white folks would read your history and then maybe you'll understand me. Give me liberty or give me death. Who said that? Rap Brown, didn't he? <laughs> what did Sophie Carmichael say? Don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> then you run around and tell me to have respect for the police and give me that old history book you showed me in your history book. You didn't have no respect for the police. Yeah, it's in there. Say it in the early days when the British was the police. <laughs> A white boy by the name of Paul Revere rode through the white community and said, get a gun, white folks, the police is coming. <laughs> now, you can understand the white panthers, can't you? <laughs> but the black panthers make you forget about your history, don't they? <laughs> they ain't got nerve enough to get upset over the rise when a nigga steal a television set and take it home with him. But you still give me that white boy history book telling me how your white folks got on that foreign ship and threw all that man's tea in the water. <laughs> what the hell are you mad at? Because we got enough sense to take it home. tell you something, if you're going to loot and take tea that don't belong to you and then tell me in your history book it was a Boston tea party, <laughs> and every time a nigga take a television set, call that a Saturday night fish fry. <laughs>
But since you lack nonviolence, we say to you to get up on that Indian reservation and cut your red brother loose because you can't be no more nonviolent than this Indian's been in America for the last 75 years. What happened to your appetite for nonviolence? Why is that Indian still on that reservation since you're supposed to freak out so much over nonviolence? As long as that Indian's on that reservation, you should never be caught uttering the word nonviolence because you prove with him still up there you have a passionate disrespect for nonviolence. And the only time you lack nonviolence is when somebody decides to get violent. If that Indian wants a better way of life in the morning, it's sad I have to sit here and admit to you. He got to understand he's dealing with such a racist, insane nation that until you make this country peep up through the muzzle of a gun, she gonna keep you a nigga. Oh, that Indian wants a better way of life in the morning, all he got to do is get out on the bar dock in Arizona and catch you white folk driving down the expressway going to work in the morning and start shooting at you, bow and yelling, red power, and why did he go home? And when that Indian tell you to go home, he talking about the big trip, baby. <laughs> Oh, just as sure as that Indian got violent in the morning, oh, the whole country be upset. I can just hear him not him stinking reds. And then come Sunday, you go home and turn on television and look at Meet the Press, and they'll be interviewing some old Uncle Tom Tom Indian. <laughs> That'll be telling all the fools everything they want to hear. I can just hear him now. Yes, me like a heap of reservation. The problem comes from them young bucks. Them Stokely running horses and rap light clouds. <laughs> as long as that Indian had enough sense to keep coming off that reservation and socking it to you and burning some of these colleges down that's on his property and getting him some of them blonde scalps and raping some of your white ladies, oh, it upset you, but you'd listen to him. That's the only thing you understand. Oh, that Indian raised a lot of hell. Next summer you turn on television, you see as many Indians on television as you saw black folks last year. I can just see it now. Tune in every Tuesday night, hour-long special, seven-part series, Meet Your Indian Brother, brought to you by Xerox, no commercials. <laughs> oh, that Indian raised enough hell this year. Next year, you have an Indian here talking to you. <laughs> you don't care about that Indian today because he's done exactly what you say you like people to do. He's behaved himself. And only in this country, if he starts acting violent, that's sad and that's shame. Would you understand? Because if he starts raising hell, all you understand then, all at once you learn that the highest form of tuberculosis among any minority group on the face of this earth happens upon your Indian reservations. The highest form of suicide rate among young folks happens upon your Indian reservation. While you march your whole army past the reservation to go to Vietnam to Guarantee some fauna a better way of life than you want to guarantee your own Indian brother who you stole this country from. You got to be sick and insane. And then who takes care of Indian business? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. Is that a joke? It's like paying the Ku Klux Klan to implement the Civil Rights Bill. <laughs> and you know how much we pay the Bureau of Indian Affairs? The money it costs to run the Bureau of Indian Affairs, if we wiped out the Bureau of Indian Affairs, every Indian in America, just from the money it costs to run the Bureau, could get $4,300 a year apiece. So I say to you youngsters, I hope that you will create a situation in America where America will become as ashamed of injustices at home as she is afraid of communism abroad. And you'd be surprised how many changes we would make. And so I say to you in leaving you tonight that black folks have got an attitude. We tired of all these insults. Now people come up to us and say, how come y'all don't want to be called colored? Or how come we can't call y'all Negro no more? That's right. That's what we're trying to say. It's safer just to say black. We don't mean to put you white folks in no imposition, but we notice you don't play no games with yourself. Why play them with us? A Jew leaves Israel tonight to come to my country. He's a Jew in Israel. He stays a Jew when he gets here. An Italian leaves Italy to come to my country. He's an Italian over there in Italy. He stays Italian when he gets here. 
The Irishman left Ireland to come to an America. He was an Irishman over there. He stayed an Irishman when he got here. We notice you ain't played no games with yourself. Don't play them with us. We left Africa, Africans, and when we got here, we got to be colored folks and Nigras and Nugras. And don't play no more games with us. You want to change some names? Call yourself clear people. <laughs> Change your thing, being that we both made that same trip across the Atlantic, it didn't change you. It better not change me. That's what we're talking about. We're tired of these insults. And we got enough sense to know that we can't stop white folks in this country from insulting us. And we hope you get enough sense to know you can't stop us from reacting to your insults never again. Oh, it was groovy once upon a time. 20 and 30 years ago, black folks in America had an empty stomach. Today, black people in America have a full stomach but a hungry mind. And a hungry mind will not tolerate the same thing an empty stomach did. Empty stomachs deal on smell, and hungry minds deal on sound. And all at once, this country don't sound right to us anymore. That's what we're talking about. Four years ago, three white bars burned up their draft card. And within two weeks' time, the Senate and Congress had passed an anti-draft card burning bill. Remember that? We haven't been able to get them to give us an anti-lynching bill in a hundred years. My country just told me she thinks more of a piece of cardboard and she thinks of my black mammy. I'll bring her to her knees for that. We're tired of these insults. I could go to Vietnam tonight and get killed by a Viet Cong. This country would give my black wife $10,000 and she couldn't take that $10,000 and buy her a house in any area she wanted to buy one in. Hell, I got killed shooting at the wrong folks. And then you tell me I got to get a fair housing bill to live anywhere in my country I want to live. What kind of animals are you? Who the hell do you think you are? That old white Russian broad, Stalin's daughter, remember her? A known communist and a known Russian. You ain't supposed to like neither one of them. You didn't make that broad get no fair housing bill to live anywhere in my country she wanted to live. Why do I need one? All them Russian exchange students you bring over here to put in your schools, they don't want to be your citizen. Matter of fact, when you bring them over here, you got to put the FBI on them to watch them four years, see that they don't steal no secrets. You don't make them Russian exchange students get no fair housing bills, live anywhere they want to live in these old racist college towns. Why do we need them? We're saying we're tired of these stinking white insults, and all we're doing is reacting to them. Now white folks tell us, Number one problem, education is your problem. That ain't nothing but a cheap, whitey cop out, because if education was the problem, the Jews would run this country, would own it. Since education is supposed to be the problem, why is it you over in Vietnam with your army trying to guarantee that foreigner freedom in the morning, and you ain't never asked about his educational standard? But you want to free him in the morning, but you want to check mine out. When you question my educational standard, question it right. <coughs> why we demand and you teach my black history in your white institutions because if you knew my history and not just what your mom and daddy told you about me you'd find out your mama come closer to being that nigga than me education's my problem you ever stop to ask yourself how many millions of people would be dead today on the face of this earth if it were not for blood plasma are you aware of the fact that a black American by the name of Charlie Drew invented blood plasma? Don't take my word for it. Check it out in your library. Are you also aware of the fact that Charlie Drew bled to death in an Atlanta, Georgia hospital waiting room after an automobile accident because they didn't accept niggas? And you want to tell us education's our problem? The man that had the educational knowledge, the genius, and the wisdom to give blood plasma to the world died from the lack of his own invention because his face was black and education didn't have a damn thing to do with it. So we say we're tired of all these insults and all we're doing is reacting to them. Oh, there's a lot of white folks in America that believe a, a nigger is the stinkingest, smelliest thing walking the face of this earth. That's your hang up. I'm not here tonight to convince you niggers don't stink. I say do your own research. <laughs> Yeah, check the records at the cosmetics industry and see how many multi-billions of dollars a year you white folks in America spend on deodorant. <laughs> and check them deodorant commercials on television and see if you ever see a black armpit. 
and then figure it out for yourself. If niggas is doing all the stinking and white folks is buying all the deodorant, who really stinks in our country? <laughs> so we saying we're tired of these insults. There's a whole lot of white folks that believe because I was born black, I'm inferior to a white man because he was born white. That's a groovy theory, but keep it in your own head. Don't insult me with it no more. You know, the interesting thing about the same white man that believe I'm inferior to him because I'm black, he would be the first one to tell you tonight that if I went to bed with a Japanese woman and gave her a baby, the baby gonna be colored. If I went to bed with a Jewish woman, an Irish woman, I can go to bed with any woman on the face of this earth and give her a baby, and he'll tell you the baby gonna be me. My sister can go to bed with any man on the face of this earth and get a baby, and the baby will be her. Is that inferior stock to you? We're tired of all these insults. And all we're doing is reacting to them. Now white folks tell us, why don't y'all quit all that demonstrating and go down the ghetto and pull your brother up by his bootstraps? Why don't you give him some boots with some zippers on them? <laughs> well, we admit down in the ghetto in America, black women in America have 20% illegitimate babies. We ain't gonna deny that. We've had fun in the ghetto, baby. <laughs> white women in America have 2% illegit. But we're tired of those insults. We'd really like to sit the record straight and would like for you white folks to, just because your white sister got 2% illegitimate babies and my black sister got 20% illegitimate babies, you wants to run around believing morally you're a better man than I am because your sister got 2% illegit and my sister got 20%. But let's sit the record straight. If we ever get our hands on you white folks' abortion credit cards, we will show you how to knock a rate down too, baby. <laughs> Before all these white folks running around talking about, how come y'all have all them babies down the ghetto? You can't take care of them, they're gonna end up on relief. We know it. The only thing we see wrong with your relief, it just ain't enough of it. I ain't never met a white man that didn't want some free money. You can tell the way y'all trick that stock market every day. You crazy about some money. If words like relief and welfare and ADC, if those kind of words upset you, change it and call it foreign aid. And we know that money you get in white Europeans don't upset you too much. And as far as all them babies we have down there in the black ghetto that we can't take care of, we make a deal with you. The day this white system learn how to hire black boys and give us good jobs like it gives you white boys so we can afford all them whores and prostitutes like you, we'll quit having all them babies at home too. You see, we don't have to ask you about that whore because it is my sister, remember? And she do talk to us when she comes home. So we do know what you're doing, baby. So we say we're tired of these insults. When I stop and think how a German killed my daddy during World War II. Had a German killed my daddy in 1942. In 1942, I was 10 years old. I'm 37 years old now. That means I would have gone 27 years without a daddy. Now that's no insult, because when daddies go to war, they go to kill or be killed. The insult is the same German that could have killed my daddy during World War II in 1942 and made me go 27 years without a daddy, that same German tonight can come to my daddy's country and live in a neighborhood my daddy's boy can't live in. Do you really understand what we talking about? We stand before we ever sit by and let you treat your enemy better than you treat your citizens. We'll burn this damn country down to the ground. That's what we talking about. And we learned that from you. We watched you burn Vietnam down to the ground to free a foreigner. We know what you do to free your mama. <laughs> So we tired of these insults. People tell us, when y'all make progress. Progress? You hip to that? I got seven little old black kids at home, and every time my old lady get pregnant, I realize how much progress we made. And my last baby daughter that was born six months ago, we know how the system hate to call black folks Mr. and Mrs., so we named her M-I-S-S. -S. That's her first name, Miss. Last name's Gregory. Anybody ever want to talk to her, gonna have to call her Miss Gregory. They can't talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> and 
Every time I look at my old ladies, black belly get big, I realize how much progress we'd made. Because every time she get pregnant, I remember that just a little bit over a hundred years ago, back down in the slave tent, when my black slave sister rushed up to her black slave man and said, honey, I think I'm pregnant. And them two black slaves fell down on their knees and prayed to their almighty God that the unborn baby would be born deformed. You think about that prayer one day. God, we're dealing with such a racist, inhumane beast that if you could give us this baby, Lord, born with a limb missing of God, if you could give him to us with his body twisted and put a hump in his back, God, if you really wanted to be good to us, God, give us this baby born maladjusted because, God, if you give us a baby like that, the white folks will never be able to sell him. And, Lord, we get to keep that baby all our life. You think about that prayer one day. And one day, my black slave sister rushed up to her black slave man, crying, tears of joy, honey, the Lord's answered our prayers. His, his head looks funny. I think he's going to be maladjusted. And them two black slaves fell back down on their knees, praying tears of joy, and thanking their God for a maladjusted baby, a baby that can never be sold, <laughs> a baby that they'll get to keep for the rest of their life. Progress. Well, me and my old lady got 70 more black babies at home, and we ain't never had to pray for nothing less long a maladjusted baby. That's all the progress we're going to give this sister. And so, as I leave you tonight, I say we tired of these white insults, and all we're doing is reacting to them. No more civil rights legislation. We want our rights under that same piece of paper we pay our income tax by. We want our rights under the same piece of paper you get yours under, the United States Constitution. No, no, wait a minute. We'd like for you to play one more game with us before you, you quit. We'd like for you to give us one more of them old trick laws called the Honest White Folks Bill. Now, don't, don't none of you get uptight because it ain't got nothing to do with white folks. Matter of fact, we'll give, it a, we'll give it a real good name. We'll name it the, the Concerned Honky Law. <laughs> I bet that'll go over big in the ghetto. It'll be a simple law to just read all five-year-old black male baby boys. See, they haven't got nothing to do with white folks. It don't even cover my black sister. All five-year-old black male baby boys will have to go to a government camp for one year from the age of five to six. And on this camp, we are stipulating the bill that these little black boys will be able to sleep for eight hours a day. And for the other 16 hours a day, the government will teach them, and that's where the honest white folks will come in. 16 hours a day, the government will teach them little black boys, nigga, when you grow up, don't never date a white woman, don't never make love to a white woman, don't never marry. Let me tell you something before we leave here. We can't believe that nothing upsets you no more than to see a nigga with a white woman and you ain't got guts enough to talk about your number one hang-up. Who in the hell do you think you are? And one day, if you ever get enough manhood to talk about your number one hang-up, you might find out one day it's something you doing to make me want that broad. And if you quit doing her, you find out don't nobody want her but you. Every time the new cars come out, you can't advertise a new car without putting that white woman in it. Buy for it. So I feel I got to get that white broad to make my gear shift right. <laughs> I'd be sitting on the plane, minding my own business, reading the magazine, turn to a page, and that white broad with a big old bottle of Pepsi Cola in her fist, talking about, have a Pepsi, honey, thirsty? Yeah, I'll have a Pepsi and you too, you old white broad. <laughs> I go to my black ghetto, go into my black house, get in my black living room with my black wife and my black kids, turn on my black television, and there your white sister running halfway across, half naked. I'm a buy a Playtex living bra. <laughs> yes, I'll buy a Playtex living bra for my old lady, and I'll buy you for me. <clears throat> Do you think niggas was born wanting a white lady? One day, if you ever get up enough sense to stop programming me, you find out you don't have no trouble with me. I went to see my first movie. I was four years old. Didn't know nothing about no white lady. My mind was pure, honest. 
Had never seen nobody make love in my life till I go to the movie and who making love? Ava Gardner and Humphrey Bogart. I couldn't even go downtown to the white movie. I had to go to the black movie and you brought that white lady out there. I, I was four years old. I didn't know what Ava Gardner and Humphrey Bogart was doing, but I had enough sense to know that one day I was going to grow up and do it. And I went to the movie every day for four years. See, in my hometown, you didn't have to pay to get into the movie till you was 12 years old. So every night I went to the movie. I never will forget, I was eight years old, had been going to the movie every night for four years looking at that white lady make love. And eight years old, I'm sitting in the movie and Ava Gardner and Alan Ladd was doing that thing. <laughs> I nudged my friend, I said, man, I'm sure going to get me one of them when I grow up. He said, which one, him or her? I said, I don't know, I think I'll try them both. Well, I got news for you tonight, I'm grown. And I'm gonna get me a white woman, and the madder it makes you, the more them white broads I'm gonna get me. And I hope it makes you so damn mad that you'll quit programming my little black kids and show them some black ladies in their movies making love. Show them some black ladies advertising them televisions. Show them some black ladies holding that Pepsi Cola bottle in their hand. If you ever get enough sense to do that, you'll find out you won't have no trouble with your lady. But the mistake you made with me, the only black woman you ever showed me in the movies was Beulah. <laughs> when you was programming this young, fresh mind, the only black woman you ever let me see advertise something for you was Angel Mammy. <laughs> I just thought you had enough sense to know that I didn't ever, never, ever want to make love to Beulah. <laughs> So as we leave you tonight, we say to you that you got a big job to do. You youngsters can solve the problems confronting America today. And we as black folks ain't asking you to do us no favors. Do America some favors. Read, ask a lot of questions, and most important, think. I read the Kerner Report on civil disorders in America and as beautiful as the Kerner Report is, you still got to watch it because the Kerner Report says to solve the problems in the black community, it's going to cost America $80 billion. I hope you got more sense than to bring $80 billion down in my ghetto. You bring $80 billion down my ghetto, all you're going to do is get the damnedest four-day crap game you ever seen. <laughs> you you want to solve the problems in the black ghettos, don't bring no money down there. You're gonna have to do something first that won't cost you one nickel as far as black folks are concerned. And that is, for the first time in the history of America, you're gonna have to create an atmosphere where black folks will trust white folks. And the way you're gonna do that, not with $80 billion, you're gonna get up on that Indian reservation and cut my red brother loose you're going to give my Puerto Rican brother his constitutional rights. You're going to free my Mexican brother. And last but not least, because my Jewish brother plays a lot of games with himself, but you should paint your face as black as mine and see what that Gentile say to us about you every day, and you realize you're in this same stinking bag with the rest of us. So what we say in short, simple, and sweet, when you free my Jewish brother, my Indian brother, my Mexican brother, my Puerto Rican brother, then at that point, we'll say, my white brother, I trust you. Come into my ghetto, and together we will solve my problems. But if you think you're going to solve my problems and keep all them other minority groups hung up, we say to you today, you better take that $80 billion and buy yourself some of the biggest guns money can buy, because you damn sure going to need them. And so as we say good night to you this evening, I say to those of you that worked on my presidential campaign, thanks. Those of you that voted for me, thanks. I sit up late on election night waiting on Long Island to come in and put me over, you know. But <laughs> Y'all goofed. You know, it was a thrill for me to run for the presidency of the United States because I was the only candidate running for the presidency. The rest of them fools was running for sheriff. <laughs> Oh, 
And we just left Washington, D.C., and we had our inauguration. <laughs> Good affair, wasn't it? We declared ourselves the independent write-in president of the United States in exile, and we went to Washington March the 4th and had our inauguration, and we're going to open up a black house. <laughs> and for the next four years, we're going to see if we can wipe out the problems of hunger confronting Americans today. And I say to you, young white kids tonight, you kids that's dedicated for human rights. You kids that want to help the Indians and help the Puerto Ricans and help the Mexicans. One mistake I hope you will not make. There's a poor, hungry, hillbilly white boy in this country that nobody gives a damn about. I hope you will make him your concern too. They busy passing out food stamps in South Carolina to black folks. There's some white folks in Appalachia that need some food stamps too. I hope you get concerned about all people. And I hope you be as interested in going into that white ghetto tutoring that little hillbilly's kid too, because he got a right to get some help. I hope you will see to it that the colleges and universities in America will open up their doors and take in some of them hillbillies' kids too. I hope you don't start helping everybody and pass your poor white brother by and make him pay the cost for this vicious, insane society. And so you youngsters have a big job. I know many of you have to go to work. Some of you got babysitters to relieve. So right now, we're going to turn you loose, those of you that have to go. And I say to you, thank you so much for showing up tonight. May nature have fun with you, and may God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.